We need radical change. These systems have to change. What have we learned over 28 years that numbers don't lie? Demographics, we predicted 28 years ago when we started this forum, we're going to overwhelm the system, but we didn't prepare. My father was right. Money doesn't grow on trees. Said that to me all the time. And so how do we do more with less? How do we figure out how to provide the care with the limited resources of money and people that are available? People want to live at home. They want to be taken care of in their own home. They want to be independent. And their caregivers want to fulfill the promise that they made to those parents to keep them in their own home. But in today's world, that doesn't always succeed. And we know that we can't replace the human touch. We just don't have enough humans. So how do we make more with less? How do we leverage the human care that we have available and make it more meaningful so that we can care for more people with the limited labor force that's out there? And we have to create the tools to make human care better, more available, and less expensive. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to this panel that's going to answer each and every one of those questions. And for that, I've enrolled Rebecca Preeby, who is the head of the New York State Association of Agencies on Aging, and her stellar panel. Becky. Thanks, Lou. And wow, that was heavy, right? Um, as Al, or, sorry, I just saw Al, so I'm calling Lou Al. Um, as Lou said, I am the executive director of the Association on Aging in New York, and I get the distinct and overwhelming pleasure to represent the 59 offices for the aging throughout the great state of New York. Um, a shout out to two directors that I actually saw in person here, Deborah Tano from Albany County and Beth Stranges um, from Shemong. And I know we have virtual attendees as well. And as you guys can tell from this morning's presentation, I get the distinct pleasure to work with Greg Olson at New York State Office for the Aging. There is not a bigger advocate for aging services in the state of New York or in the country. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have him as our leader. Um, I, I just want to say before I introduce this really amazing panel, I came to this elder law forum um, almost 17 years ago as an acute care discharge planner at a very small upstate rural hospital. And my way home on the North Way included lots of spicy language as I yelled about the changes to the healthcare system. And as I get ready to depart, the North Way is going to hear similar language the entire way home based on what we talked about today. So. I am hoping moving forward, we, we will see some changes. Um, I'm really happy that Lou asked me to moderate this panel. If I had been on the previous panel, I would have gotten on a soapbox to, soapbox to talk about um, everything the panelists talked about, but I'm here today to talk about innovations. And I will share with you, I think everyone in this audience understands the barriers and the issues that we're seeing in the long-term care um, space overall and in the aging services realm and really the need for investments. And we're very engaged with the master plan on aging. And I think this was said very well before. You can't have a master plan on aging in the state of New York without investments. And we currently have 14,000 older residents that are waiting for services who are above income for Medicaid but can't afford to privately pay for the service. And I want you to keep that in your mind when we talk about innovations because the reason these innovations, innovations have taken place is out of necessity and out of the goodwill and dedication of the service professionals that you see here today um, who really have thought outside of the box on how we can maintain operations with such you know a declining workforce and so many barriers and so many issues post covid so i'm really happy that i get to end today on a, on a very happy note to talk about really amazing innovations from people that are so dedicated to the work that they do and I think what's nice about this panel is you have people from many different sectors that are going to talk about what they did specifically within their own population to really lift overall health and make sure that that the state of New York can remain age friendly and that we can control costs while still, still serving the individuals who we care for. Um, I'm not going to read through the, the bios in depth just because I know we're very short on time. Um, our first speaker is Alicia Kelly. Alicia is with CDPHP, um, and I can tell you that it is a health plan that is really doing amazing things in this space to make sure that we are doing exactly what we talked about. We're preventing expenditures to high cost healthcare utilization. And some of the things that they're doing that Alicia is going to talk about um, are really just wonderful member benefits that I, I am hoping long term other plans will look to to make sure that we're supporting individuals in homes and communities. So welcome to Alicia Kelly. 
Um, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. I can't even believe how many familiar faces I saw today. It was a little bit like old home week. So, so nice to see so many of you here today and, and feeling so passionately about this community that we serve. Um, oh dear. All right. I can't see. So hopefully this works. All right. So, um, you know, in thinking about how to, how to speak to you all today, really my focus is around Medicare Advantage. So for those of you that are that are serving that, that population, we all know that inflation is very real and very impactful to our senior community members that are living on such uh, strict and stretched thin fixed incomes. And so we've really embraced the regulatory changes that have been in place um, around Medicare Advantage that have allowed us to expand into supplemental benefits and trying to address those SDOH barriers that are preventing people from addressing the root cause of what is causing their health concerns. Because many of the things that our seniors are facing and even, even you know, people of all ages, they could be addressed through nutrition, fitness, uh, transportation, just things that sometimes we take for granted. So um, that's really my focus today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we've done to help support and enhance in hospital or in home services, meals, weight loss, fitness, um, OTC, and, and most importantly, telehealth. So one of the cornerstone products that we offer on our Medicare Advantage plan is Landmark Health. Landmark is a program that we offer to our most vulnerable members, and we identify them as having six or more chronic conditions. These people are very needy, and they're on a lot of medications, and they need a lot of support. They are able to access 24-7 in-home support through a care team that is managed through Landmark Health. So this health, this team is consisting of doctors, nurses, uh, care managers, it could be behavioral health specialists or even pharmacists. It's really based on what the need of the member is. Many of the seniors as they grow older and access to transportation becomes more challenging to them. Um, it could be eight o'clock on a Thursday night and they need to see someone but their doctor's office is not open but they can't get themselves to an urgent care center or they can't get themselves to the emergency room. So they call 911 and they incur an ambulance. That is expensive and most likely unnecessary. Landmark Health empowers that member to call them. They will triage for them. If they need to go to the hospital, they will assist them in getting there. But what we find is many times people are relying on emergency services when it is unnecessary and it is expensive and sometimes can be dangerous. As we just heard the, the panel before, emergency rooms are understaffed and they're backed up. People are waiting hours in urgent care facilities or emergency rooms. This allows our members to remain in home, be safe, and allow also that coordination with caregivers that may be involved in the services um, that the member is needing. Um, our next program is for our individuals that are actually in the hospital. So we call this CDPHP Hospital to Home. It is available at the hospitals that are listed on the screen. We have staff that are embedded in these hospitals that will come bedside to any CDPHP Medicare Advantage member. They will come to them when they are admitted. And then most importantly, they will assist them at checkout time. If any of you have ever been hospitalized or had a family member hospitalized, it can be very overwhelming physically and emotionally. You are scared. You have a new diagnosis. Perhaps you had a surgery and you have a long road of recovery ahead of you. You're overwhelmed. Perhaps you're a caregiver and you're, you're nervous and scared about what's been happening at home. That's what our team is there to assist you with. If you have follow-up appointments that need to be scheduled, if you have prescriptions that you need to get to, we will help coordinate all of that for you. If transportation is a need, we will assist there as well. We wanna make sure that when people are discharged from the hospital, the most, the most critical thing on the top of their mind is just getting better. And it's not worrying about all those other little life factors that get in the way. As our members are discharged, um, we wanna focus on a lot of things, but nutrition, wellness and fitness, certainly top of mind. When our members are discharged from the hospital, they are all provided the uh, opportunity to receive 14 meals delivered directly to them at home. 
that will get them through one week of knowing that they have nutritious, healthy, and I will even add tasty food. I've tried it um, at home. So the last thing you want to have to worry about when you're getting out of the hospital or that your caregiver wants to worry about when getting out of the hospital is getting to the grocery store. Maybe you have food at home, but you're not capable of standing in the kitchen and preparing it. Now you do not have to worry about that. So really for us, that is one of the main components that we want to ensure is taken care of when someone gets home. For the members that are maybe a little bit healthier or looking for social connection, we have the Senior Fit Program. And I will tell you outside, someone actually approached me and said, why don't you promote that more? So we promote it all the time, and I'm going to talk about it later. Um, Senior Fit is for our members that want to be a little bit more active. We have a partnership with Silver Sneakers, and we also have an exclusive partnership with Sakati here in Colony. All of our members can get access to these fitness centers at no cost. It is the same as if you walked in off the street and purchased a membership. Anything that is available to an individual as a regular um, member of that gym would be available through Silver Sneakers. It also includes classes. Many of these sites will have Silver Sneakers specific classes. So maybe you're intimidated and you don't want to take hot yoga with a bunch of 20 year old girls. Well, you don't have to. You can take chair yoga with all your peers and your friends. So, you know, I'll also just add, it's so much more than fitness. It's also about that social connection. We all know post pandemic, people have been isolated and it has been so detrimental to everyone's health. These programs allow people to interact and get that social connection that they've been missing. And then the last thing I'll just mention on this is we also do reimburse our members who want assistance in losing weight. Maybe you're just getting started and you need a little kickstart, or maybe you just need help losing those last few pounds. For our members that perhaps finances are a financial barrier to accessing a Jenny Craig, a Zoom, a, a Noom, I'm sorry, or a Weight Watchers, we will reimburse them up to $100 every year for participation in those programs. Uh, Over-the-counter benefits, this is not specific to CDPHP. This really is table stakes right now in Medicare Advantage, but everyone does it a little bit differently, different quarterly allowances, different way to access the benefits. For CDPHP, our members get up to $75 per quarter that they can use towards the purchase of over-the-counter items, such as bandages, Tylenol, heating pads, things that we may take for granted that we have stockpiled in our house. Um, but these are really important things that when you have a minor incident at home, that if you don't treat it, it can be exacerbated and you do end up in an urgent care or an emergency room. And some of them are expensive. Cough syrup, $15. Many seniors don't have that kind of excess money that they can use to purchase these items. So we wanna make sure that they have these dollars available to them so that they can continue to live a healthy life at home. And the last thing I'll mention is a program called Doctor in Demand. This is a convenient and low cost, really no cost program that we offer to our Medicare Advantage members as an alternative to urgent care. Again, coming back to that discussion earlier, urgent cares are understaffed. How many of us had to go to an urgent care facility sometime over the pandemic? You waited in your car. For, I can tell you I waited in my car for three hours one time. Um, it's, it's, it's a shortage. It's a staff shortage. We all know this. This is an alternative to that. It is 24-7, 365 days a year anywhere in the United States. You will be connected to a board-certified physician who is licensed in the state in which you are calling from. You can call from home. You can call from your hotel room. You can call from the beach if you want. They are there to assist you. They have the ability to write scripts. They have the ability to order lab work, and they will share this information with your primary care doctor. So it's not an alternative to primary care. It is really just a convenient, no-cost alternative to urgent care. At CDPHP, we live by a mantra. We want our members to be happy, healthy, safe, and secure. And these are the programs that we've been able to innovate and implement to help keep that motto going. And we look forward to continuing to, to do these things as long as the federal government continues to allow us to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, I told you we were gonna turn this party around with the positives. Um, really, really appreciate your insight on that and really great things that the plan is doing. Um, our next speaker is 
Um, not only an innovator, he's a leader. He's been a mentor of mine since I met him years ago and um, had a complaint session about the home care space and has really become a friend in the advocacy world that I live in most days. Um, but on behalf of his membership, he is president and CEO of the Home Care Association of New York State. He believes in the work that all of his members complete and he is the best voice in Albany and he is a team player to talk about how we can continue to assist older people in their homes, people with disabilities and how we can increase utilization of the amazing home care network that we have in the state of New York. So it's my pleasure to introduce Al Cardillo. Thank you so much, Becky. Uh, and uh, again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you again this year. I think it's a record crowd, Lou, right? A record engagement. And I think it just underscores the significance of these issues. Um, the, you know, I, 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 I arrived to hear the, uh, the conclusion of the last panel. And uh, uh, I just wanted to echo Michelle Mazzocco's comments about the fact that if if the providers, if the practitioners could do it their own way, they certainly would do it very different uh, than the manner in which things are approached. Uh, and, and, you know, really the key is to try to really change the system around so that it accommodates what the practitioner needs to do, but ultimately what the recipient of the services wants and needs that, that correspond most closely to the way they want to live and the way they want to receive care. So one of the things that that certainly we've been trying to do, uh, working very closely with the State Hospital Association, Dora Fisher's here, and she's been on on our project team, and the Iroquois Association, uh, Becky and her uh, her association, uh, SOFA, OMH, is really we've been working to try to foster collaboration between sectors of the system, between partners, uh, in 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 uh, trying to promote models that allow for more seamlessness, that break down the balkanization that so uh, often is is uh, so rigid within the system and prevents people from really receiving patient-centered supports and services. So I'm going to talk about some of those models today that we've been working on together. And also within that, there's resources within these slides. I think, the sl I think everything is going to be shared. You're welcome to go to these links afterwards, not only to, for information, but also there's access to training uh, in uh, cultural competency and mental health and, and other, other related programs that might be of value to you uh, and your teammates. Okay, so... In terms of in terms of using you know the idea of collaboration uh, models for solutions, these models can integrate core partners. It's, it put, basically put them on a similar page, you know, with respect to their mission uh, in servicing an individual, serving a particular episode or a condition. Um, it uh, it optimizes care and it optimizes efficiency. It helps overcome fragmentation that exists in coverage. And I'm sure you've talked about that quite a bit today. We know where Medicare has a cliff, private insurance has a cliff, you know, Medicaid and so on. But collaboration helps overcome fragmentation there in services uh, and in models. And it solves gaps that exist in access and in quality. We know that in many areas of the state, there's a paucity of resources. Uh, and it's sort of like the idea of synergistic, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And if you can get physicians, home health agencies, hospitals, health plans, behavioral health providers working together in true synchronicity for a common cause, you can overcome what are many of the gaps and barriers that exist within the system. And so that's what we're trying to do. In COVID, this was right in the initial part of COVID, um, we were approached by the Mother Cabrini Foundation for insight on, you know, what, what, what could the foundation do to help? Where were some of the problems? And we knew that there was going to be a surge in the, into the hospitals. We also knew there was going to be decompression issues of patients that needed to be discharged, but not, not necessarily a timely or an appropriate place to go. And like, oh, did we learn that? And so what we what we suggested was is that if hospitals and home care agencies as the bookends of the system and working with physicians could be supported in their mutual work together, that perhaps we could overcome what some of those really key crisis points were at that phase, but that also we would utilize that development for lasting effects within the system. 
improvements that would strengthen the pre-acute, the primary, and the post-acute and recovery at, at, at community. And, and that's really what we, we set about trying to do. And one of our first goals was to look across the state at where there might be innovations going on that were organically developed by hospitals, by home health agencies, physicians, and others, and present them, curate them, and present them as, as modules, present them as prototypes that we could use to support other hospitals, home health agencies, and others in that work together. <clears throat> and and what, what was revealed in that process were, were models that truly can serve as a blueprint, not only for New York, but really across the country. Again, under this, under the foundation, we we developed this initiative. We implemented it starting in 2020, uh, and it's still going. We are still working with Haney's and with Iroquois and others to make to drive this this whole program forward. Um, to try to uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, share uh, broadly share the experience in these models, our team. Uh, mutual teams put together four uh, recent reports uh, that we provided to the governor uh, in January that cover collaboration in, in some key areas. The first uh, report, and again, these are all available to you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, again, you'll probably get the slides with the materials and then the links will be available, or you can contact me at HCA and we'll get them to you. But the first one really focuses on the hospital home care uh, a, a portion of that. Uh, and as part of those models, there are models that, that address critical illness and recovery that, that, that ultimately uh, engage the patient from the time that person is in the hospital with a critical illness, brings together the primary care team, the critical, the critical care team, the home care team, everybody works together to plan how best to transition that person through the through the acute care stay transition to home and then and then with continuing care and support often during that latent period where where critical issues reemerge and the person deteriorates and ends up back in the hospital this is an amazing program uh, by the University of Rochester uh, 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 Medical Center and their home care program and their primary care that integrates that whole process. So the person is not seen as a hospital patient, a home care patient, you know, a primary. They're seen as an individual. And those services are all uh, uh, interchangeably, you know, networked and coordinated. Just a couple others that I'll mention to you on this on, on the list. Um, Another program, which is which is implemented in a small community with two rural hospitals and a small rural home care agency, they developed a tool which identifies in uh, uh, the high risk conditions or works off the identification of high risk conditions. You know, uh, uh, congestive heart failure, COPD, diabetes, and and other. In in six to seven months, they reduced the rehospitalization rates of those patients from about 16 or 17 percent down to six percent. So if you think about the impact, and so was this a high-tech mechanism? It wasn't. It's a pretty straightforward tool, a paper tool. But because it is taken and integrated in with the physician practice, the home health agency, and the hospital, that's the level of impact that that tool has. I'll talk about one more and then just go on. The other initiative that is uh, one that um, is done on Long Island, uh, and it, it's a program that is a pre-op, post-op uh, support program for individuals that need major cardiac and orthopedic procedures. In this program, contrasting with at one point in time, a person would go into the hospital, they'd have their pre-op, all the services, they'd start their therapy, and then they would go home. In this model, all the pre-op, is, is done while the person is at home with the surgery scheduled. And then all of the planning for the post-op is done at that time. Then that person has probably what is often now an ambulatory surgical procedure, a major one, or maybe an observation stay. They come back home, all the wound care, all of the um, uh, all of the uh, you know the post-op therapy and monitoring and, and med rec and all of those things that are important are also done at home. So if you look at the of the pie, the narrowest slice of the pie is in the acute care setting. Positive for the patient, you know, positive for the system, and certainly great for the payer. Are there any special waivers or anything for that? No, 
There's no special waivers. It's basically practitioners, providers getting together to figure out the channels. I'm just going to reference several of our others and then I'm gonna pass this on so that we everybody has a chance to speak. In addition to the hospital home care uh, collaboratives that I've just been talking about, we also, working with Becky and the State Office for Aging, have put together a, a, a primer on developing these collaboratives that engage local offices for aging and local aging network services. Very often, uh, the, the aging network services, when plugged together with the home care agency, the hospital and the physician group, can achieve bridges that can't be done under the current coverage models because they don't pay for those services. And so, but so instead what you have is the collection of individuals and agencies making up for what the formal system doesn't do. We have a similar document on, on behavioral health. And this will have a series of models that again, for your uh, uh, information, attention and use uh, also integrates the behavioral health component. We have a further one that focused on the experiences of all the vaccine hubs. Like what happened to those hubs? Nobody hears about them anymore, but they were the focal point. But, but working together, we worked with every single hub to chronicle what they did to create community-wide collaboratives that integrated faith-based organization, home care, physicians, you know, all of the ancillary services, which in the context of a collaborative aren't ancillary, they're available to meet the needs of, of the recipients. So that's the other report um, that I wanted to mention. We have on our site videos that actually are video spots interviewing the practitioners that run these programs. And then there's, I will just mention these by name in case you have an interest in exploring these. One is we are, we are testing in three counties soon, we hope to be five regions of the state, models of community medicine and paramedicine where we're integrating EMS with home care, with hospitals, with docs, to create a coordinated community structure. And the outcomes are already very dramatic that we're hearing from that. We've spoken historically about the work we're trying to do in sepsis, which tries to bring partners together to address sepsis, uh, a very, very serious issue uh, where time is of the essence in responding and coordination is of the essence. And so uh, that's another initiative. Becky asked me to specifically to, to call that out and happy to talk about that issue more as we go forward. I think at this point, let me, pass the mic on so that uh, others have an opportunity and happy to answer any questions. Is it me this time? It is. Um, and if you'll notice in your um, agendas, I got the last names with the absolute most number of vowels as a test because it's the end of the day. Um, so thank you, Al, for your comments. That's really amazing. Our next speaker, um, we're kind of shifting lanes a little bit and really talking more about the integration with the disability and aging and long-term care community. And I think what's really wonderful about what John Breitenbach is going to talk about is really some innovations that they've done on their side of the house. John has been with Living Resources in many different capacities since 2011. Um, and when you hear him speak, you're instantly going to hear how amazingly passionate and dedicated he is for the work that he does through Living Resources um, with some really kind of cutting edge things. So I'm gonna turn things over to John. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I also wanna say this is my first time here, but I did wanna mention and echo kind of what Alicia said about, this is pretty cool. This is, there, there's a lot of people here that I don't know. There's some that I do. Um, they're all doing some pretty incredible work and it's uh, really inspiring to be here. So thank you. And also thank you to the audio and video, visual, visual people in the back. I think you're doing a great job today. We're I threw you off a little there, sorry. So as Becky mentioned, I've been working with Living Resources in various capacities since 2011. I actually started as a part-time employee in one of our after-school programs. Um, and 12 years later, I'm sitting here in front of you, so I'm not sure what happened, um, but, but here I am. Get the slides going. So I'm gonna talk about numbers real quickly. I think that these will be a little bit easier to digest, not quite as uh, um, heavy as some of the numbers that we've seen today. Uh, they're very exciting to me. Just a quick snapshot of what Living Resources is up to these days. Um, we're serving 861, in, oh, excuse me. We have 861 staff members, over 1,500 individuals supported, which goes for about just under 30,000 um, hours of service per week, which is a pretty good total. And all of that kind of flows through 13 different supportive programs that are offered at the agency. 
Uh, that's a lot of a lot of numbers. It's uh, in my small part of what we're doing that feels a little daunting and I'm, like there's a lot going on. Um, but I can definitely say that even if there was only one program um, that we were offering, it would still require a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation, um, and a lot of ability to maximize, again, what's possible in a system with dwindling resources, which is certainly the case um, in OPWDD, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities in which I work. Um, but I think that we can all agree on that really across the board. And I just love this picture. I just think this is great. Some of the people that we work with. So in terms of innovation at Living Resources, I, uh, I want to focus on three different areas, uh, one being self-direction and fiscal intermediary services, which some people may be familiar with. Um, there's varying degrees of familiarity with self-direction, I've found. I won't get too into the weeds. Um, but we also are going to talk about our housing and technology innovation. Um, and even though I am not a clinician, I am going to speak a little bit about the advanced behavioral support approaches that our agency and specifically our clinical department is working on, um, because I think they're very fascinating and really, really great. But I'm going to start with self-direction. What is it? What is self-direction? Uh, I'm not going to read the OPWDD definition for you. Um, you can go ahead and do that, but it's a very good surface level definition that I think really captures the spirit of what the service is. Uh, basically, it's empowering the individual to direct their own services. Um, again, it is a little surface level, so some of the specifics that can come with that. Uh, Self-direction allows the individual to hire their own staff which in a lot of ways allows them to pay that staff person way more than living resources or a lot of other agencies could. You can assume that that does create some flexibility with the type of um, person that you might be able to work for or work with there. It also gives you flexibilities in terms of who you can hire. There's a lot of agencies that would be maybe a little uncomfortable with an individual working with a family member. That's not how we feel. Um, it's certainly not how self-direction works. Um, and we really believe that you have to provide those flexibilities for people, again, in a world of dwindling resources. A couple of other things that you can access in self-direction that are really helpful and I think really maximize independence. Um, you're able to engage with your community a little bit easier. You know, you can get classes, health club memberships, gym memberships reimbursed. You can have transportation reimbursed. Um, and one of the one of the best things that I find about self-direction is the access it gives you to housing subsidies for the ability to live on your own independently with the proper amount of supports. So one more thing I wanna show on self-direction, I won't get too far into this one, but it really self-direction I believe is a changing of the status quo. Um, I like simple visuals. I like red is bad, green is good. That's really what you need to understand here. The arrows and the red circle, we don't want them going that direction. Okay? We want the individual to be leading their services. We want the individual to feel empowered to be able to do that. And it's challenging to do that when a service provider or a care manager, I use the term broker up there, which is specific to self-direction, or maybe even a family member, um, sometimes under the status quo, they're the ones leading the charge. 90, 95, maybe 99% of the time, that's with the best of intentions. Um, but what we believe in at Living Resources is we want the individual to lead that. We want them to be empowered. We want them to be the ones who are telling Everybody in that circle of support, because every individual in self-direction has their team, their circle of support. We like the green circle. We want the direction, the arrows going the other direction. The individual should be telling the service provider how they want things to go. The individual should be, thank you. The individual should be telling the brokers and the care managers how they want things to go. And probably most challengingly, we want them to be able to sometimes tell their family member or their natural support how they want to live their life. How, I know that how I live my life is very different than my parents wanted me to live my life. Um, and I had the freedom to do that. Everybody should have that freedom. And that seems like a very obvious thing, but it is really a change in the status quo. So I'll move on quickly. Allow me to get through all these. I think I got it. There we go. I think I got everything up there. So part of committing to self-direction um, really requires a commitment to a shift in culture. Self-direction, the program, hits every single part of your organization. It certainly is hitting every part of our agency. Um, fiscal, direct care, really everything. So everybody needs to be all in. 
right? If you don't have that, you're not going to be a successful agency and you're certainly not going to be a leader in the field the way we want to be and that we feel that we are. Um, one of the ways in which we're doing that, going from a care-focused approach to a more of a citizenship, a partnership approach, um, is our independent, excuse me, our independence ambassadors work group, which is a large group of people from all corners of our agency. That's part of our executive team, our direct care staff, the people that we serve, their family members, uh, board members and community members, even some vendors that we work with are all coming together to try to pursue that, pursue that citizenship approach. Changes to our policies, changes to our practices, um, and changes to our training to that end. Um, again, I mentioned housing innovations. I'm really excited about these. I'm trying to, to, to contain it a little bit. I'm really into housing. We've had a lot of great discussion about that today. And obviously we know that there's not enough housing. Um, so Living Resources is working really hard right now on three separate housing initiatives, one of which is a grant that was awarded to us through the Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative. We're partnering with a local mental health agency on that one to open up some non-certified housing. Part of why I'm really excited about that is that we get to work with another really great agency. One of the potential issues that you might run into um, in our field is that there's not a lot of support for people who have a developmental disability who also maybe have a mental health diagnosis. It is very challenging. Um, I'm not an expert in mental health because I come very much from that disability world, but I know that we need to collaborate with the people who can help us get to that end. Um, again, I think something that sounds pretty simple that ends up being innovative because you just have to do the work to do it. Um, so that's exciting. We were also awarded a supportive housing transformational grant from OPWDD, which will allow us to open up about 10 what are called supportive IRA apartments, which are probably a step up in level of care and level of support from a truly non-certified independent living, but are still without 24-7 staffing. So a little bit of an adjustment for folks who might be living there. Um, and then finally, partnering with a local uh, affordable housing developer for six affordable housing units in the city of Schenectady, right in the middle of Schenectady. So those three initiatives, plus as many others as we can possibly take on uh, in a reasonable capacity. Again, there's not enough housing. Um, there's not enough supports for people to remain safely in housing and age in place if that's what they wish to do. So that's what we wanna do a lot of. One of the ways in which we're doing that, because we know that the staffing shortage is real. We know the staffing shortage is not going anywhere, most likely. So we need to figure out other ways to make it work for people. And the way we do that is through enabling technology. Um, one of the many reasons why I'm very excited to be here today and with this group of people in particular is that I actually get to work with Diane. She'll tell you a lot more about it. She's, she's better than me at talking to her about it. Um, but you know, we get to work with Everhome, we get to work with Viva Links, uh, which was discussed earlier, and we're really working on a pilot program that we hope will help a lot of folks stay in their homes. And then the last thing, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, is I just really would like to, to mention what our clinical department is working on. Uh, I find this very exciting because I'm still learning about it. I'm not a clinician, I'm not a mental health expert, but what I can tell you with absolute certainty is the truly, truly effective benefit that the people that we do serve get from these therapies. I'm very proud to say that we're the only OPWDD provider offering dialectical behavior therapy. We also call it DBT. I called it DBT for a long time before I learned the full, the, the full name of it. And it's what, well, again, what I can tell you is how effective it is for the people that engage in it. Our director of clinical would be very upset with me if I didn't give you the proper definition, which is that DBT offers specific strategies for emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness for clients that are struggling with intense emotions, struggling with trauma, all right? It helps them to understand those difficult feelings, to accept those difficult feelings, and to learn how to manage them. We're also the only OPWDD provider for offering virtual reality therapy which is done in conjunction with DBT. Those two things together, um, pretty great results. Uh, the, the, my very layman's way of describing the virtual reality therapy is that it's really good practice for those difficult situations. I know that I wish that I had a little bit more practice in some difficult situations over the years, and I think it's a really great benefit for the people that we serve. And the last thing I'll mention is our next innovation, um, which I'm really excited to hear about. It's cognitive analytic therapy, 
which differs from DBT in that it is helps individuals to understand the root causes of their difficult emotions, um, where do they come from, and to accept those emotions. And now I'm realizing that I didn't change the slide, but that's okay. So that's about what I have for right now. Again, I want to be respectful of other people's time, but I do want to say again how appreciative I am to be here. Um, everybody here is doing fantastic work. I'm very honored to be on this panel with these very, very talented people. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, really, really great and inspiring work being done. Um, our next speaker uh, is not only a personal friend of mine, but she is a visionary. She's relatively new in her position, but you can see from her bio, she has such an, a long-term wealth of knowledge, both in clinical care, but also in community empowerment, long-term care services, supporting older individuals. And you're gonna hear um, a personal story from her as well today. Um, in full disclosure, I do chair the board of directors that oversees Everhome because I truly believe in the mission and the values and the importance of the work that is being done um, in Columbia County specifically. But, you know, from the aging lens, I can tell you this model is something that's not only going to be statewide in the near future. It's something that the national stage is really going to pay attention to because it, it hits on every point that was talked about today about making sure that we're able to age in homes and communities, that we use technology to our benefit, and that we really really make sure we have a comprehensive care team looking at individuals. Um, and Diane is a friend of mine, so we can we can have a little bit of levity because I always struggle with pronunciation of her last name. Um, as you can see, it's, it's intense. So as I introduce Diane, I'm just going to remind her, Diane Mickel, we got to be Owski. Thank you, Becky. And um, my employer has suggested that I drop my husband's name because it's just too difficult. So. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I'm a little nervous about advancing the slides, but let's see how it goes. Oh, I did it. <laughs> yeah, at least I could see Al's slides just fine on his laptop. They were great, guys. They were great. I find that my positioning on this panel in, in the order that we're speaking is perfect. Um, Al, innovator working with associations, the home care association, assisting providers, health systems to create those innovative models. Alicia, from the health plan perspective, the innovative programs that you are advancing through your company. John, Living Resources, also excited to be working with Living Resources on a program as well. And you heard the, the absolutely innovative um, things that they are doing. So you see, I'm using the title of this presentation, Innovators, and, and here we are to me. Um, us, Everhome, Viva Links, we are where, ooh, I'm supposed to advance, I'm, now I need two hands. Okay. So that was the slide that was supposed to be up while I was talking, representing Everhome Care Advisors and Viva Links. And where technology meets touch. So I'm already ahead of my slides, but that's okay. I'm going to move it along. So we are the integration of all of this. We are the collaboration, the connection. I like to call us the connection that helps bring it all together to communicate with all of, all of you and all of the people on this panel and the programs that they have. Now I'm going to, I hope I'm not stealing anyone's thunder here, but I wanna talk about connections and I wanna talk about each and every one of you out there. I've had some fabulous conversations today. This is my first elder law forum. And for you that stopped by, for the people that I've talked with, the people that I haven't talked with that will give me a call, right? Um, I wanna say thank you. I really would like a round of applause for each and every one of you innovators out there in this room. It's, it's just been very inspiring. And I think we've all said the same thing. So I, I won't keep saying that. So I'm going to tell you how we do this integration. Honest, I am. I have to flip because I can't see that thing down there. So I'm glad I printed my, my slides. So we want to talk about our care coordination ecosystem. And, and Dr. Miles talked a little bit about how our technology meets our human touch. So the human part of the care coordination is our social workers and RN, 
that provide this life care coordination as we call it. And it might involve medical assessments that we don't do, but we gather those assessments. We interview people, we perform home assessments. We might look at home safety. If we go into the home, we're definitely looking at home safety. And that's part of our care coordination model. It's going to look at medication management, scheduling. What are the needs? Looking at those social determinants of health. What are the needs that these individuals have? And then we're going to see where they're at. And then we're going to look at our technology and say, what part of our technology and our program could help them, could help them age in place, could help their caregivers. And I'm gonna tell you a little more in detail in, in a second about that. But we like to call this ecosystem where we blend the, blend the two together. So ooh, that, that, okay. So the problem can't be solved by people alone. Number one, what have we heard all day today? Depressing, right? There aren't enough people. There are not enough people on this side. There is a lack of people to provide these services. And we out there that are providing them, we're running as fast as we can. We're doing the best, the best that we can. So our technology can help, but the technology can't do it alone. We talk about establishing trust. We have to bridge that human factor first because there's a fear of technology, right? A, a lot of our clients, a lot of our elders say, oh, I, I can't do technology. Now you've had the benefit. I was going to show, I was going to show a video during my panel presentation, but we've actually shown those videos during the breaks, I hope you got to see them. And, and some of the videos were shown out on our tablet, out on our table. But <clears throat> we need both the technology and the people together to help solve these problems. The technology can bridge some of those gaps and it can help extend the possibility. So I'm gonna move right along because I wanna get to the fun part. Well, I guess it's the fun part, okay? So one of the videos, videos you saw, I wanted to just pull out a quote from that, that video where Susan, who's a caregiver, who both of her parents were part of our program, she was able to keep working. And she said it was really blending technology with the caregiver's needs. And I really liked the way that was phrased. And another very intelligent thing that she said, and we all need to realize this, and I think many of us do, if you wait until you need it, it's too late. Right, we we all know that, so we should all be we should all be planning. I think that goes for a lot of things. So, whoops. Hopefully, you got to see a little bit of our technology out there. But here's a, a picture of it, and I'm I'm going to do a very quick case study, and I'm going to make it about me because I can talk about me. Okay, um, Greg Olson in his presentation. He was speaking to me. Uh, I'm a caregiver. I'm a caregiver for my parents. I'm a contributing member of the workforce. At least I hope I am. I'm still working full time. I'm also a Medicare card carrying AARP member. So Greg Olson was speaking to me. I care for my parents. I'm caring, you might have caught me looking at my watch or looking at my phone. I use our technology. I'm checking on my parents. I've been checking on my parents all day today. They're doing fine, by the way. Um, but I use this technology. It allows me to still, I'm not ready to retire. It allows me to still contribute. It allows me to help with this innovation. And when I joined Everhome and Viva Links, the beginning of the year feels like a long time ago, but that's because it's just so energizing. Um, I knew I wanted to keep working. Retirement wasn't an issue for me. So my mom has Alzheimer's and she has lung cancer. My mom is on hospice. I have been able to be part of her hospice visits during short breaks, short breaks at work. Um, and I'm able to use our tablet, do a video call, talk to the hospice nurse. I'm able to check in on my mom. I'm lucky that my dad is still 
with us and he is home and he is able to provide care for my mom, but he's 89 years old and he's getting tired. So maybe we should have had this a few years ago, but we have it now and it has been a lifesaver for me. It has given me peace of mind. It has allowed me to say, okay, everything's okay at this moment or uh-oh, what's going on? So. This is our tablet. Again, it was out on our, our booth there, but it's a seven, 17 inch touch tablet. And people, on one of the videos you saw, one of our uh, life care coordinators was talking about um, asking their client, do you operate a remote control? Do you dial a telephone? Do you push the buttons on your microwave? You can use this tablet. It's very intuitive. It's visually very simple. It's also extremely customizable. And that's what I want to say about our program. It's not an all or none. It's about the assessment. What does the client need? What adjunctive services will help them remain and age safe in place? And let me step back. I was talking about my mom, but we're also seeing now people who are active seniors, independent seniors, wanting to get involved with this technology because we're aging. And the, the reality is, as Greg says, the minute we're born, right, we're, we're aging. But the reality is I'm a physical therapist by profession. I'm not going to bore you with any kind of research studies, but we need to stay strong and keep you know, strength in the bank because we lose it as we age. And there are inevitable things that happen when we age. So planning ahead, getting technology in place, talking to a life care coordinator about your plan is, is inherently important. So the touch screen, you can do a video call. It is secure. It is, a, is it HL7, is that the right number, Lou? Um, HL7 and HIPAA compliant. It's not, like an iPad, because that's some people say, why don't I just get an iPad? It's not like an iPad. You have to be invited to participate on this platform. It attaches to the internet or it connects to the internet, and then it connects to a VPN. And the only people that can make calls or connect to you on this or access it are people that have been given the access and have passwords, et cetera. So video calls, we mentioned that a lot, but there are and you can see on there, there's some, some of the screens, but you can also see on our tablet outside, there are games. Um, games are fun, games are engaging. People with dementia have reacted to these games. There are videos, there are old time radio stations. Again, very customizable. I won't go on and on about that. From a clinical standpoint and a care management standpoint, schedules, schedule management. If I get a call from my doc, my mother's doctor's office today and they need to change her appointment, I go on my app, my VivaLynx app, which is on my phone, which communicates to the tablet, and I change her appointment on her tablet, sitting at my desk or sitting here when you're not, don't know that I'm playing with my phone. So I can change her appointments. I can see if she's taken her medications or not. And I also, so we have also peripherals. We have security cameras. Um, well, they're called wellness cams in, in this application. Motion sensors, bed sensors, chair sensors, and uh, PERS units, uh, personal emergency response units. And I can see when my dad opens the cellar door, I'm like, uh-oh, hope he's not going down those stairs. And I can see, and he closes the cellar door and then I can go, phew, you know, nothing happened. I can see the front door opens. They never use the front door. Why is the front door opening? So I then access the wellness camera and say, oh, their pastor's visiting, good. Or if I haven't heard from them in a while, I might check, I don't wanna disturb them if they're sleeping. All of those things allow me to be here today, allow me to go to work every day and to help problem solve. I'll give you one quick example and, and then I'll move on. In the morning, my mother has a bed sensor. So I, we know when she is in bed and when she's out of bed. 
My dad, they have very different schedules. My dad likes to work outside in the garden, whatever. He says, I can't because I don't know when your mother's getting out of bed. I have to wait for her to get out of bed. No, you don't, dad. He has his VivaLinks app on his phone. He can go out in the garden. He can go out and mow the lawn. When my mother gets out of bed, he gets a message on his phone. Okay, he stops what he's doing. He goes in, he helps her. She needs some direction. He helps her, he gets her breakfast set up. He can go back out and finish and he can check on her with the camera or he can let me know. He can communicate with me. Hey, can you keep an eye on your mother every 15 minutes or, or whatever? One morning I got up and I looked at the app. I don't have them wake me up at night. He said, it's okay, it can wake me up. You don't. You can get a good night's sleep. I look at the app and I can see the history. And that's another important part of this, the data collection is it's starting to learn the behavior patterns. And I know their behavior patterns. So I look and I see she's been out of bed since 2.30 in the morning. Oh, what's that about? I go to the wellness camera. There's mom tucked in her recliner with blankets sleeping. There's dad tucked in his recliner and sleeping. Okay, they're fine. I don't have to go running up there. But I knew that wasn't a normal behavior pattern and something was up. So I simply left for work about an hour and a half early. I'm lucky I live close to them. I stopped at their house, let myself in, had some things I had to do, some laundry I needed to take care of for them, never woke them up. My father's proud. He doesn't like to ask for help. I was able to help them. So I hope you're getting the message how this has helped me and allowed me to care for my parents remotely, to keep them living in their home, to give them autonomy, but know that they have the support. Again, communicating with the hospice nurse while she's there and allowing my brother who lives um, down south, allowing him to have access to them and see what's going on. Plus there's pictures and there's all kinds of great social things that makes it very attractive. She tends to watch her tablet more than television now, quite frankly. So um, we want to gather that data. We have many, many plans going forward. You'll have to catch me at another time to hear about those, but going forward, how we collect that data, how we use that data to make decisions, how we share that data with health plans, providers, associations, and move this initiative forward to bridge the gaps, extend the care a little bit. We're not going to toilet people with this technology. We're not going to get them out of bed with this technology, but we can help learn what they need with this technology. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for listening to my story. And I'll pass it back to Becky. Thank you, Diane. I think it's really uh, two takeaways from today. Well, a lot of takeaways, two really in-depth takeaways are the fact that Stan allowed his story to be shared, which I think is beautiful. And that Diane shared her story as well. And I can tell you from an advocacy standpoint, every year, hundreds upon hundreds of people go to the state Capitol. We talk to elected officials. We testify at budget hearings. People talk about their most intimate personal care needs publicly because they're so dedicated to this work. Um, so I really thank Stan 